one of the things that you you've been researching a lot more recently is artificial artificial intelligence. Um, and I wonder for people who are listening to this, like let's imagine someone uh, like everyone's heard of AI at this point. We've heard of we've all heard of ChatGPT. Um, but I think going a level deeper and understanding like what is it like, how did it get like how did it develop over time, and why is it that some people have been talking about AI for like ten plus years. Others have just heard about it last year when ChatGPT got big. So I wonder is, like, can we start with what is artificial intelligence? Like, okay. how should we? Let's start yeah. at the beginning. Sure. Uh, even in, in, in Aristotle and others, there were, uh, in, the, in the Greek mythology, there were uh, examples of uh, the idea of the, of the robot human that plays the lyre and tills the fields, mm. right? So th- this is, ha- there's always been this, Beautiful anthropomorphizing and quest for the the other, which could either be the the mechanical human that alleviates our toil. And in fact, the term robot uh, comes from roboto, which I think means toil hmm. in Czech. You, you can check me, and I believe it was. Uh, come on, who who who? It was R U R Rostrum's Universal Robots, a play by Carl Kapich. Is his name uh, from about 1920? Mm-hmm. All of your right now, all of your listeners are pausing and, <laughs> and going on Google to find me out. I'm a fraud, okay? But I'm close enough. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, or also the idea of the golem or the Frankenstein monster. We not only anthropomorphize, but we create our evils yeah. and embed it in it as well. So we've always had this um, idea that we could have an artificial being that would resemble a human being. But it was Alan Turing who sort of gave us our initial construction of it, first on a paper on computable numbers, identifying that there could be a universal computing machine, which would, which I fully don't understand. It would take too long to truly under, to explain. But And that was around 1935 or so. And then around 19, I want to say about 1950, uh, he writes uh, the paper in the psychology journal, interesting that, mm. Mind, uh, on the imitation game, mm. in which he talks about this, he introduces the Turing test, later to be called the Turing test. There, it was the conceptual idea that we need to program computers that can make decisions like a human would make decisions. So suddenly it pursu- it asked the question, how do humans make decisions? And so there was a whole movement around from the 1950s to the 1990s to take the ways that human make, humans make decisions and enshrine that into computers. That's through the hardware and more importantly through the software. And the hardware is pretty simple. In fact, we use our computer hardware analogous to the human mind in which we have a we have memory and we have a processor right something that stores information and something that uses information to come up with an input and then an output and an answer and and the original computers were made on the model of the human mind okay but then we also had to create a system in which we were going to render into software the ways in which humans made decisions. So we think sequentially and we think rationally. So if we create a long list, and the original programming language of AI was called Lisp, for list programming, we could simply write down all the rules that we use as heuristics in terms of making decisions to get our output. That seemed logical. It was deeply, deeply flawed. And the reason why is Humans don't think sequentially, like we were a jumble of ideas all at once. We, do we think rationally? Well, we've spent the last 25 years in cognitive psychology and neuroscience to look at all the ways that we don't think rationally, that we actually embed cognitive biases through everything that we do. So the, that was actually, that showed promise and it got us so far, but no further. The early games became like fool's gold. We thought we were getting closer and closer, but then it became harder and harder and harder to reek out any benefit of it. So what happened during this period? And then we had these ideas called the AI winter. This was in the 70s, 80s, and then later in the 90s. There was one, two, or three, depending on how you count these. But the the broader point is that these winters were when government funding and industry funding shriveled up for AI. And about the year 2000, 2005, if you said you worked on AI in academia, you got laughed at and Mm. couldn't get a tenure and couldn't Mm. get a post because it just seemed like, again, it was a fool's quest. Sorry, question on this front. So a computer working out that two plus two equals four, that's not AI. Great question. 
let's 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 pause the 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 my my discourse to say that I'm going to introduce this concept of machine learning and sti- what's really a shorthand for statistical machine learning okay. and changing the method to go into that. Nice. So two plus two equals four is um, is a truth. It's almost like a almost like a Euclidean hmm. sort of um, uh, foundation, right? It's it's basic arithmetic hmm. of the of the origin of mathematics. Um, we should also say mathematics is a little bit trickier still because at the outset it didn't it was, took it took several centuries before we had or millennia before we had the concept of zero, hmm. right? So we started with one, right? We needed a zero, and discovery was important. But that's simply to say that we needed imagination and a, and a conceptual shift hmm. to understand mathematics. But we have a one and we have a two, okay? And we have a two plus two equals four. If we can in if we can enshrine that into a computer that can generate that same answer all the time and then can actually conceptually have an idea that anything with one added to it becomes one more sequential that would be ai right it's it, by definition it's it's intelligent or f- however we want to define intelligence we could talk forever about it and it's artificial the key thing that sort of the, one of the earliest aphorisms in ai was that we call ai anything we cannot do yep. once we know how to do it we call it a calculator or we call it a uh, a search engine yeah. or we call it voice recognition or we call it self-driving cars mm. but the frontier of what we can't do we refer to as ai okay. and then when we have it it's like oh that that oh that oh that's just a search engine yeah oh that, that's nothing like that's simple i'm used to that right yeah. but of course it's you know google itself is absolutely re- remarkable the reason why is the explicit versus the implicit a world in which we're trying to design and the world of Lisp and AI proper, the original of the origin of AI by when the coin was termed in 1955 at a conference at Dartmouth by Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, among others. There was about three people from Britain there, one of them part of the Selfridges family, by the by. That there, it was about explicitly instructing a computer, a set of instructions to program it on if I give you a, a big uh, decision tree. If I give you these instructions to do this, you therefore produce this output. And I've got full explainability. I can see on a piece of paper the program that I've then introduced into the computer. The shift that happened, um, weirdly enough, around that time in the late 40s, early 50s, there was several people. Frank Rosenblatt is is one of them who died prematurely uh, several years later in his 30s. Uh, They looked at a different technique. And that was to apply statistics to the problem, collect the data, have the machine make an inference modeled on the human mind, on the neural network of the human mind with nodes and a a decision layer. Sounds a little bit like deep learning. So what happened is that the, the, the grandees of AI, it's like an academic squabble, in this case, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy at MIT and then later at Berkeley, looked at this issue and said, oh, that's never going to work. And they were not wrong. They were right. It wasn't going to work because of the constraints in computer processing power and memory and cost at the time. But everyone went through the the instruction based of AI, classical, what was called GoFi, good old-fashioned AI, (laughs) GoFi. And they they, uh, tried to embed a large decision-making tree on how to make decisions. Expert systems is another term for it. At the same time, this weird method that was poo-pooed and no one had any trust in around the 80s and the 90s and the year 2000s was a statistical machine learning. Just give the machine a lot of data, let it work out the system for itself and make an inference. You don't need to know all of the ways in which it can find these variables and covariables and coefficients to identify why it makes a decision under these conditions. In Mm. fact, it's so intricate that it would exceed our human capacity to grok how to do that. But the effect is that it works and it works better than alternative systems. Take images. If I show it lots of images, if I describe a cat as having hair, having ears, having a tail, having almond-shaped eyes and whiskers, that's great. What if I'm looking at the cat that doesn't have a tail from behind? How do I know it's a cat? Right. The answer is I'd have to program and say, oh, here's the exception. What if it's like this or like yeah. that? Right. It's crazy to come. You'd never, the real world is such that you'd never have enough ability to create all these, these exceptions. F- give it, you know, a quarter of a trillion 
would, wouldn't be that many, but uh, several million examples of cats under all lightings, all conditions, all kinds of cats. Ask it if it's a cat or not. It can do it. It's statistical, right? That method was totally, you know, not part of the research agenda, but it showed promise and it was so effective. There was really only three people in the world who were the leading lights and their students who were pursuing this sort of ridiculous ambition. Mm. One's named Jeffrey Hinton. The other one's named Yoshi Bengio. The third is named Jan LeCun. Mm. Jan LeCun became the head of AI at Facebook. Oh. Hinton at Google. Yoshi Bengio stayed uh, in Montreal uh, in academia, but became an advisor to companies. They won the Turing Award a couple of years ago. The term deep learning and the AI revolution of around 2012 yep. was, and this was grace of them. There was other people, Peter Norvig and Russell Stewart and uh, Stuart Russell and others. The key is this. They reframed AI from trying to give it explicit rules to giving it information and the, the computer coming up with its own set of rules through an inference. It wasn't explicit. It was now implicit. Hey friends, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this clip, then click here for the full unedited episode. And if you like that, then do please consider subscribing to the channel. It means a lot. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.